Let's consider how photography was used as an art form in itself in the 1800s. Few things we'll notice. There are new possibilities created by the glass negative and albumin print process. We'll see that composite images are made with multiple glass negatives and large paper prints during this time. The art photography reflected an interest in what they considered artistic images as superior to photography's use as an impersonal recording of the world. During this time, photography was closely connected to the worlds of literature and art in England. We'll look at two figures in particular, both of them working in England, Oscar Rylander and Julia Margaret Cameron. Now this is a daguerreotype, this is from 1845, and this just represents how from the very earliest time of the use of photography, it was being used to replicate the kind of images that people considered to be art already. Okay, so this is a kind of a pose, a kind of subject matter that people already embraced in painting. And so people were making daguerreotypes that looked like the paintings that they already enjoyed. When it came time to make daguerreotypes as portraits of people, when people were commissioning daguerreotypes of themselves, they wanted them to be as flattering as possible. So daguerreotypists would use the best of their skill to light things properly, to angle things in ways that were flattering, but then the daguerreotype is going to record every little wrinkle and every little stray hair. So they wanted to go in and retouch those daguerreotypes to make them look as flattering as possible. So if you look at the one on the right, you can see that the detail has been softened a little bit by very, very careful brushwork, and they would sometimes add a little bit of a, of a pink color to the cheeks to make it look a little bit warmer in, uh, in, in impression. So from the very beginnings of photography, people were using the tools that were available to them to enhance what the camera captured. That was just part of how they used the medium. Now when the 1850s come around and they're able to use the glass plate negative and albumin print output to make multiple paper prints of photographs, that opens up all kinds of new possibilities because people can collect multiple copies of those prints themselves. They can have prints of all of their friends and family members. They can cut them apart and put them into albums like you see on the left and then they can start being creative with them. So from the beginnings of the carte de visite and those albumin paper prints, people were cutting the faces out of the prints and making their own collages of them and that's what you're seeing over on the right. There are a lot of examples out there in museums and in private collections of albums that people had, photo albums from the 1860s and later, where they used their collage skills to put things together very creatively and expressively in their personal collections of photographs. And sometimes they were very creative indeed. So these are uh, these are um, collages that were made by sort of upper class wealthy women who might have a lot of time on their hands, particularly in the winter time. They're there in their estates with their collections of photographs, and they use their artistic skills to sort of interpret little stories and personality quirks of the people in their um, in their circle of friends and family. So from the very beginnings of the positive negative process with the calotype, uh, this is this one goes back to 1846. This is just to show that uh, that the the manipulations of the negative by the photographer were part of how the calotype was used from its very beginnings as well. This is this goes back to 1846. So this is an example of the kind of, uh, of photograph that was made as an artwork for popular consumption as a collectible art print. Now, this was made by Henry Peach Robinson and this uh, example comes from 1858. It's called Fading Away and it depicts a sort of a sort of a story, sort of a moment from a story where a young lady is dying of tuberculosis and her family members are sort of collecting around her and just sort of preparing for the inevitable. And these kinds of very 
sentimental images were popular for people to collect. They collected these kinds of images as, uh, as lithographs and as enga engravings, and now they're able to collect them as photographs because photography can be used to composite these things together. And this is made from multiple negatives that were composited together by the photographer to make a completed final image. So here's a very, very dramatic, very uh, almost operatic in its drama image called The Two Ways of Life. And this is made by Oscar Rylander in 1857. Now this was made, it, uh, multiple copies of this were made as albumin prints and they were distributed to print shops so that people could buy them and frame them and have them in their homes. So what you're seeing in Two Ways of Life is a story that's being told about a father who has two sons. You see one son on either side of the father in the center. The son on the left is being sort of called away by the ways of sin and iniquity. And the son who we see on the right with his very gentle, dramatically expressive pose is being called away to a life of virtue and service. And you can sort of visually wander through this image and see all kinds of uh, gambling and lots of nudity and, uh, and, and and all kinds of illicit behavior going on on the left. And in the background, you can see that there are vines growing up the, the column on the left, which are associated with sort of de decrepitude and things sort of having gone to seed. And over on the right, you can see there's craftsmanship and there's skill and there's learning and there's virtue. And there's a very virtuous young lady who, um, who would be presented as maybe a better, uh, a better option for the young man on the right to choose, as opposed to the, the options that are being, that are calling away the young man on the left. So this is the two ways of life. Now bring this in. This is Raphael's The School of Athens, a very famous uh, uh, Renaissance era painting that is composed with a structure that has the two main figures in the center under an arch. This kind of structural composition is typical of Renaissance painting, and it would have been very familiar to the educated consumers of fine art prints in the Victorian era. So the fact that Rylander composes his print, The Two Ways of Life, in a way that sort of evokes connections to the Renaissance is very intentional. Here's a close-up that shows you some of the, uh, the iniquity that's going on over on the left. You can see there are two men that are gambling, and there's one man that's got his hands up to his head as if he's lost his uh, lost his money in gambling. There's another man who's being led away in handcuffs, and of course there's all kinds of nudity and lasciviousness going on over on this side. And then over on the virtue side, you can hear a few, uh, a few detailed images. Um, and if you look at it closely, you can see a little bit about how the images don't line up exactly perfectly. Many, many negatives went into the construction and assembly of this final print. Here's one of the photographs that was, uh, that was then, um, the, a print from it was cut apart and then reassembled and re-photographed in the process of constructing um, the final image of the two ways of life. So those kinds of images, which are very heavy-handed in their symbolism, um, were typical of the kind of, a kind of popular photography that people were after at that time. So here we have a photograph by Charles Baudelaire, a cultural critic of his time, a renowned author uh, and, uh, and, and a man who knew how to throw shade. So this is a photograph by Nadar who we saw um, a little while ago as a well-known portrait photographer of the wealthy and, uh, and, and high status in, in France. So, so Baudelaire said about this kind of photography, he said, I'm convinced that the badly applied advances of photography, like all purely material progress for that matter, have greatly contributed to the impoverishment of French genius. It is simple common sense that when industry erupts into the sphere of art, it becomes the latter's mortal enemy. And in the resulting confusion of functions, none is well carried out. If photography is allowed to deputize for art in some of art's activities, it will not be long before it has supplanted or corrupted art altogether, thanks to the stupidity of the masses, its natural ally. So this kind of photography was not universally accepted among connoisseurs of art. 